Hi, this is Mary Book of Alice and we're on Star Scene. Today we have an excellent author with us, Mark Mordew. He's award-winning Australian writer, journalist and editor. He is also the author of Boy on Fire. Hi, Mark. How are you? Thank you. Nice to be here or there, <laughs> whatever it is, virtually at least. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. Um, now, your book has been out for a little while now and it's been getting rave reviews and I'm one of those who was totally mesmerised by this um, because not only did you do a journey into Nick Cave's childhood, but you brought it to your present, your mm. moment in time as well, and you wrote a lot about yourself within this, which is quite different to the traditional biographies we read. What made you do this? Uh, I felt that there was some need to, to an extent, to explain why the project had taken so long, because it was a decade before it came out, and there'd been a lot of talk about the project, a lot of hype, and then a lot of sense of failure and crisis around it. And there was an, it, 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 the fact that it's a portrait of the artist as a young man. So it's basically Nick Cave's boyhood and teenage years. So completely formative and formative as an Australian artist, which I think is what gives the book a, a lot of value and even rarity because it's a very undocumented time around Nick and, and how he became the artist and the human being that, 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 that he is in many ways. So I needed a, a larger contextual area just to somehow give a doorway in and a doorway out to the nature of the book and to other parts of, of, of Nick's life as well as my own. I, I don't really put myself into the, the main body of the narrative, but I'm there either side of it. But I was also interested in, in a without sounding too pretentious, a kind of meta-biography sensibility where you have the, 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 the book, which is Boy on Fire. Uh, you, you have that portrait of the artist as a young man, but you also have a sense of me as the writer outside it in those framing chapters and also coming through in terms of voice at times and, and kind of breaking the frame when there are one or two moments where as the narrator of the story, I turn to literally uh, address Nick and where other voices in the book, people I've interviewed, say things to Nick as if they're talking to Nick. So that I think is, is different to the normal biography as well. And I think that also helps sort of keep the book alive in a strange way in terms of the language and the, the, the form of it. So it has all the classic things, born here, raised there, these friends, these influences in serious depth, but it also has this other kind of emotional tone and, and a sense of many voices, my own included, there um, around it and sort of underneath it. Most definitely. And even the sense of, you know, you travelling with him and, you know, the, the instances in the car, like a metaphor for travelling through life, with him at that moment, but looking back on his life when he was growing up. It's natural. Cars are a part of our, our life. You only have to listen to a Bruce Springsteen song or think of how COVID's affected us in terms of shying away from public transport and being back in our, our little vehicle bubbles again. And naturally with Nick, like I toured with Grinderman, I, I travelled around Melbourne with him, spent time in Brighton. You know, like we were, we, we always seemed to be in cars or, or mini vans with the band or whatever. So there was always that sense of mobility and, and that gave me a, a sense of just of, yeah, of, the, of a journey with Nick and, 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 and in a sense too of, of it, the journey being limited or temporary, that I was in this intimate space, kind of hurtling through space with Nick and, it kind of reminded me of Higgs Boson Blues, which I, I say in the book, but, but sooner or later we would obviously part. So I'm the passenger uh, and, and I hop on and, and, and come the right time or the wrong time as the case may be, I have to sort of step out again. So I wanted to have that energy and I just wanted to have that sense of motion 
as well. You know, so the, the, it's not like a static thing where you're declaring all these facts and giving this information. But I, I wanted the sense of, hey, we're, we're not only talking, we're not only experiencing, we're moving through time and space here. Yeah, that was excellent. And I love what you said about being passenger at that moment because um, a lot of people who are in your position might find it, um, yes, you were friends with Nick, but to what point and uh, is it a real friendship? Will it stop? Will it end? Uh, almost that, you know, like almost famous type uh, oh, thing. Yeah. I love that movie. It reminds me a lot of when I first came to... To New, from to Sydney from Newcastle and I was pretty young and raw and you know maybe it wasn't quite like that but there was a lot of similarity so there's something beautiful about that and some of that naivety and sense of being with anybody famous never leaves you if you meet someone famous there's a natural sense of being nervous or whatever I mean I got to know Nick pretty well and so that's those sort of unfamiliar nerves disappeared and, and Nick's a, a very respectful, uh, friendly, amenable guy and you know, made me feel very welcome, very comfortable, um, gave me access to the band, to friends and to his family, particularly his mother. Um, so, I mean, he was, he was very uh, good at making me feel uh, grounded and he's, you know, he's a really, you know, as you would expect, a very funny intelligent great guy to communicate with but in terms of friendship for sure you know particularly with someone like Nick Cave I would see how people would seek to attach themselves to him permanently one way or another and biographies are strange things and, and I, I knew this from reading past biographies of people and from teaching uh, narrative journalism and creative nonfiction at university and the whole art of biography thing and writers like Truman Capote and Joan Didion, you know, whom I'm a big fan of. Yeah. Um, the, all these dangers of getting caught up with people and, and not even dangers, just the, the, the strange relationships that get formed over time. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I feel I did uh, become friends with Nick and that uh, the communication at times could feel very close. But as a writer and as a biographer, there is this weird sense of needing to separate yourself and detach and take a step back. Ultimately, that happens in the writing. So the interpersonal stuff when you're with a person can get very chatty, but there's something about writing that, that does inherently uh, detach you and make you more objective. And in fact, I think you have to be careful of that because it can, can make you sort of pervert past situations and become much harder or, or crueler in the act of writing because you do become detached. So you kind of have to counterbalance the, the, the make sure your emotional tone is as correct as your detail in, in terms of what the truth of something is. But mm -hmm. in terms of actual friendship, I always felt with Nick, it was like a working friendship, you know, whether, I mean, if we'd been working at McDonald's when we were 17 till 20, or if we were working at a pub together, whatever it might be, naturally that that type of working friendship is going to dissolve when the work ceases and I think that's a dilemma for a lot of people with Nick that they want to maintain the friendship but once the work is over the, the, the it's not that the friendship is over but it just fades away it, it, mm -hmm. it falls falls off the tree and and that that's that's just life you know yeah. that's, no, that's, that's, that's how you yeah. Yeah. And you said you've got to be careful of not being too hard on Nick because of that emotional attachment. A bit like when you wrote about his mum and dad being harder on him because he was at the school they taught at, you know, librarian and teacher at the school. Yeah. I, well, obviously it was a lot of pressure on them. They were very respected members of the community in Wangaratta. Uh, you know, uh, Nick's mother was the librarian at the Wangaratta High School. Um, Nick's father, Colin Cave, was a, a major figure around the town, both as an teach, English teacher at the school, as a kind of very motivated community theatre director and later at Melbourne Theatre in, in Melbourne. And he was a big uh, figure in adult education across the state, like a, a pioneer. Like, I mean, Nick's father, Colin Cave, was a dynamo. And if Nick hadn't become the star that Nick has become, many people would see him as Colin Kay's son. I mean, this is the strange thing about it. 
but you know, like the scale of, of uh, success is is just you know like different. But yeah, Nick, Nick's father was a a pretty big figure, and Nick's mum was a pretty amazing. Well, she died just recently. Yeah. Was a pretty amazing woman as well. But for sure, they you know they naturally felt pressure from the community and the school because. Nick was becoming kind of wilder and more difficult and getting himself into all sorts of strife. And basically after first year of high school, they decided to send him off to boarding school at at Caulfield in Melbourne. And that was very upsetting and alienating for Nick and a really, really difficult time. And, um, And I think it was difficult for them too, you know, like they felt they were doing the best they could for their son. And and it probably was the right decision. But There are things that Dawn said, his mum said, that you actually then told Nick and he didn't know about, like, you know, the decision to send him to boarding school and how, um, you know, the, the time in the car that she spent with her friend discussing what was the best option for him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's a lot of moments like that in the book. And yeah. I mean, Nick actually wrote to me recently to say there was a lot of stuff, particularly in the Wangaratta period of his growing up, that he didn't know that that, that, that had happened or that, that people thought and, and said. And he found that really interesting and, and even kind of moving. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a... Uh, I mean, the, the, one of the things I tried to do in the book too was sort of present different contesting or varied points of view. So I interviewed a lot of people and there are kind of, um, some people have polar opposite opinions or perspectives on things that happen. Other times it's more a matter of sort of nuance and shifts in detail. But I wanted this sense of many voices combining and for the truth to not be 100% fixed like a butterfly pin to a board, but almost as if the history was still alive right now and being lived which it is it's, it's like our own memories that we turn over it's you know it's that idea that the past is never truly past it's within us and it's still there alive and and kind of turning over all the time as we look at it and trying to figure out who we are right up to now definitely and i love how you give the reader an insight into even the way nick nick uses that uh, you know the rivers how you spoke about the rivers and how um, things are idealised in our minds. But Nick, when he writes songs that have anything to do with rivers, it seems as if he's gone back to that time. Yeah, totally. I I mean, you know, he's he said in the book that like an obvious example would be a great, great song like Sad Waters, Mm. Um, uh, something that really struck me when I was in Wangaratta walking around was a song like Red Hand, the lyrics weren't these abstract things. They're actual things in Wangaratta and you could walk from one part of town to the other part of town and just follow the lyrics of the song. They're as, they're as good as a map. They're that literal. Um, and there's lots of other sort of textures and and just energies and feelings that pop up in songs of, 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 of Nick. You know, uh, so, I mean, all of us, all, all of us look to our childhood and, and our, our teenage years anyway, particularly as we get older, to sort of figure out what most affected us and why we are the way we are and, and, and not even what formed us, but, but we kind of go back to it to, 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 for energy, you know. So particularly if you're a poet or a, a songwriter or a painter or a filmmaker, like you, you, you look to something about your youth as a sort of petrol creatively to, 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 to take you to a new place or remind me of who you thought you could have been because it's the dreaming time in your life. Mm, it's beautiful. And it's a very much like the poetic sense you get in your book as well, which is what makes it so beautiful to read and mesmerising and very different to other biographies, as I said earlier. Um, why did you choose Nick Cave? Well, especially, well, especially, and I'll go back to this, especially since that first interview, I would be crying with that first interview. I'd be so upset. <laughs> well, I wasn't happy. Uh, um, for people who don't like, my first interview with Nick was just a disaster, you know, phone interview. And then the one after that was a face-to-face where, 
he was so out of it that it just all kind of fell apart, but it was certainly interesting. And Nick was notorious in the 80s for being a difficult interview and even frightening, although I never found that personally. He, he, he was difficult, but he was never unwelcoming or unfriendly. It was just, it was just hard, hard work to sort of get through. And that, that was a combination of things from drugs to a, a natural suspicion of journalists, particularly bred by... Uh, his experiences with the NME and a, a general, and, and it was part of the punk thing too, the, the musicians hated journalists and there was a sort of war as much as anything. It was more like a battle than an, ex, than an actual conversation. That, that's, people kind of forget all that stuff now, but it was certainly present. But I mean, really actually, you know, I'd always respected Nick as an artist, certain albums that I'd I loved, you know, like the birthday parties, um, Bad Seed album, or Nick's first solo album from Her to Eternity, um, or, or Your Funeral, My Trial, um, that kind of thing. But but I'd not ever been an, an obsessive fan. But you, how could you ignore Nick Cave? He's really the, been the, one of the premier artists, uh, Australian artists, uh, ever since he began. So yeah. you can't just step around that and, and and he's always been interesting but really a friend of mine suggested it this other writer friend of mine Jack Marks he said hey Mark you should do a biography of Nick Cave and I said no nah, I don't <laughs> do that I, I don't want to you know park my life under someone else's star and then I, I, I started to think because of the idea of doing biography just didn't appeal to me and then I started mm -hmm. to think about I thought well I have seen the birthday party and and Nick play Every time he's been to Australia, I've interviewed Nick a few times. I've interviewed Mick Harvey, you know, I've, I've interviewed Bim Benders, I've interviewed this person, that. And I thought, wow, I know everybody. And I've been writing about music, art, film and interviewing, which is why I'd interviewed all those people for the previous 30, 40 years. And I was like, gee, I'm, I'm totally across this. And you know, I'm like a made man in the mafia, practically. So uh, I actually thought, wow, that's a great idea, Jack. And, and then I started to put it together and there was a lot of enthusiasm for it. And there was a few kind of slightly uh, un uneasy communications at first between myself and Nick's management. And then they just gave it the go ahead. And the more I talked to Nick, the better things got. Um, and it only went sort of a bit pear-shaped after Nick's son, Arthur, died in just terrible circumstances. And about a year after that, Nick asked me not to proceed with the biography anymore. And the reality was, so far as he was aware, the whole thing had fallen in a heap anyway. I, 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 it, it was taking an impossibly long time. I'd been through a relationship bust up. Um, I didn't seem to be doing anything. But the terrible irony was just as Nick was starting to think, look, look let's just write this off. Um, was when I was getting my life back together and the wheels were coming back on to the project. So, you know, we had to kind of agree to disagree about that because I couldn't throw away nearly a decade's work. And, you know, Nick kind of curved around again to a more neutral place and indicated that he wasn't going to oppose it, but he wasn't going to support it either. So, so it's, it, it, it's a weird energy. It's kind of an authorised unauthorized biography I uh, which has probably been a, a for its uh helped it been for the better to have been through that process where there's some friction and distance came into it so i, I was glad and it was really really nice of nick to, to to write to me and tell me that he liked it because there are things in the book i know that he would not like but that he was he saw the project in a bigger way that he appreciated the writing that there was stuff that moved him. I mean, that's 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 really great of him to do that and to to sort of see it in a in, in a bigger way. Because but you did. I could read a biography of, of of myself, you know, and I, I don't think I think it's impossible for anyone to read something because it's 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 not you. It's a version of you by someone else. Yeah. Really touching how you did address the death of your son too. That was just devastating. Well, you know like I've got kids um, so it's not like I can't relate to the feeling of the potential feeling of loss um, but I mean you know 
obviously there's no way I can kind of fully understand that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just wanted to be truthful and respectful and uh, talk about as I would talk about it with anybody, you know, because mm. it's not like some remote thing that happened to some famous person like Nick is a flesh and blood human being, his, his wife Susie Bick, you know, um, you know, Arthur's brother Earl, you know, you know, his half brothers, you know, Luke and Jethro. There's all these people, you know, Dawn, Cave, yeah. Nick's mother, who I met many, all, all these people deeply, deeply affected. I have to sort of touch upon it. Um, and, it, 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 you know, it's, yeah, it was just a terrible thing. Yeah. Um, and my heart goes out to them. I mean, even talking about it, I can kind of feel it. I think everybody can. I think I don't know that I could do it, you know, that what he has managed to do, which is why it's been so helpful uh, to people who, who've lost kids, uh, which is really a remarkable thing that, that Nick and Susie have done with the, yeah. with the film and, and with his red hand files and he's talking to us, very sort of brave and it's fantastic, but it is intense. And his music. Yeah, most of all, you know, particularly a kind of a, a, a masterpiece like Ghostine, uh, mm -hmm. Skeleton Tree. Yeah. Just great track records. And I think Nick will continue to make great music and continue to ad ad advance. And I just hope that the biography I've done, which is just a slice, is, is enough of a prism for people to get a feeling for, 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 for who Nick is and for a whole bunch of influences that, uh, impacted on him and also other lives that were important too that were around him from friends who had their own dreams when he was in living in Wangaratta as a boy to you know uh, important influences like his girlfriend Anita Lane who was an amazing creative who was an amazing creative person in her own right to you know collaborators like you know Mick Harvey and um, you know, Roland Howard and the other Boys Next Door birthday uh, party members, Bill Calvert, who was just a brilliant, brilliant drummer, and Tracy Pugh, who was a really wild character, as well as a great bassist, and, and the entire Crystal Ballroom scene, which had an impact on Australian film and fashion and art for, for decades afterwards, with all these amazing figures, you know. So I wanted to sort of document uh, not just Nick, but a, a whole sort of social realm and all these incredible figures within it that may not be quite as famous as Nick, some not famous at all, but who had a part to play and influenced Nick and also had made lots of interesting and great work in their own way all over the place. So it's kind of like Nick is the star of this big landscape or realm that I try to portray in, in, in an historical sense. Definitely, because you do talk about not just the artist, but the Australian scene. And I never experienced the Crystal Ballroom, but I have heard so much about it. And I learned so much more by reading those sections in your book too. Um, well, I, I never, obviously I never went down from Newcastle and I lived in Sydney. Mm -hmm. I could kind of relate to it through my own experiences in Sydney in the eighties of the trade union club and sort of transpose that vibe onto the Crystal Ballroom, which would have been a much more beautiful and theatrical place than the Tradie, which was just kind of three-storey concrete madhouse. <laughs> but, you know, so I was able to use my experiences to colour and energise how I... And also what people said. Yep. I mean, there's a funny element in the book because it's a non-fiction book where I feel... I'm standing on the shoulders of giants in the sense that the things Nick tells me, the things Mick Harvey tells me, the things Phil Calvert tells me, the things that the various art painters, musicians, um, all kinds of people, Nick's mother, I mean, they're all really smart. And so everybody says amazing things. And, and I'm putting the pattern together that the, the, all these voices really lift up what you learn and how you feel and, and how you see what's going on. 
and definitely comes out in your book. You've written it elegantly, intelligently. Um, I think everyone should read this. It should maybe be in the school curriculum. I love that. You know, I have wondered because of the the structure and the, the way it reflects on the, the, some of the difficulties of writing biography, I, I have thought, actually, I would love to see it uh, at, at, on some university curriculums because I, I think it has something to offer there about how one approaches writing about a, a big uh, profile subject. Definitely. That's amazing. I think, so, I think so too. I think we'll put it out there. Yeah, yeah, I'd be stoked with that. I, I, I really felt that it has those. Having taught it myself, I thought, gee, it's a, it's a classic, but really. What's next for you, Mark? Uh, well, it's, I've actually I've had a novel on the back burner for a long time now that my publishers are really interested in. They want to see me kind of advance the literary side of my career. I know everybody says they've got a novel and you want to roll your eyes. Yeah, and then I've been thinking about a possible sequel to the to Boy on Fire as well. I mean, it, it took so much out of me. I was, I'm, I've been very reticent to commit to it, but I've got enough material to do like a volume two, which would basically be London and Berlin and mm -hmm. Sao Paulo, uh, which is a kind of a neat and focused uh, possibility. So I'm giving that a lot of thought uh, because people have been so excited uh, about Boy on Fire um, and, I, and I feel like kind of you know I owe all these people that I spoke to that, that never saw an outcome and um, I'm in a better place than I was five six years ago when it when things kind of fell apart on me and the books come out and so the idea of doing uh, London Berlin Sao Paulo definitely appeals to me you know um, so there's that so novel possible sequel that's looking more probable. And I'd like to just put some collected journalism together too. Um, you know, the, the, being a rock journalist initially and then just art, like it's such a kind of transient, you know, floating kind of wildlife. You tend not to keep great records or mm -hmm. you shove things in shoe boxes and so, and you know, I mean, I'm not the most organized person on the block, but I've been very lucky to meet and speak to the incredible people that I've spoken to. Mm. Uh, Nick, obviously, among them, and all the people around Nick who helped me put the book together. Um, so, I've, I've had a, a lucky life in, in that respect. So, I'd love to have a collective journalism. And I just write tons of poetry as well. So one more question about you know the book: Have you figured mm -hmm. out if it if Nick Cave is the man or the myth? Well, for me, it's, he's the man, you know, because yeah. I've, I've met him so many times. I, yeah. I, I feel I know him as best as one can um, know anybody, um, and uh, I mean he. In public, he, he's, he's, I know there was a lot of talk about, and I'm not sure how he feels about himself, but he used to talk a lot about how he's kind of become this, he has become a, a celebrity and a mythical figure, and you sort of become a, a super being, like you cease to exist as you once existed. And it's like the idea, of the mask begins to become who you are. <laughs> Yeah. But I also think through the Red Hand files to some extent, and definitely the, the talking to as he did on, on, on stage all over the world. There's a sense of him trying to um, uh, emphasize and um, reclaim who he is as a, as a, as a human being. So I, I, I think in all facets, the man, but he just happens to be a very uh, extraordinarily talented and hardworking one, you know, to give his due. So he's not, not he, he, you know, for a man, he's pretty, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> One last question, Mark. What is your scene? Uh, my scene? Gee. Uh, well, you know, it would seem to be my, my work and my kids. I work a couple of days a week at Addison Road Community Organisation, which is a community centre, uh, which is a great place. I love the people I work with and uh, uh, what goes on there. Uh, in, it's in Marrickville, um, 
and it's all centered around social justice, environment, um, runs a sort of food pantry for people in need. So that's all very kind of uh, grounding, I guess, and uh, inspiring for me. Yeah. Uh, I do their media stuff. And my kids, you know, like just looking after them, uh, you know, um, and um, dealing, trying to do my best to sort of support their um, dreams and, and hopes and, and day-to-day life. So, and, you know, I mean, you know, my scene really, like, is probably my kitchen, you know, just sitting <laughs> sitting here listening to music and, and um, writing and reading, you know. Um, so, yeah, working kids, really.